Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you guys today. I am here with the beautiful and amazing Lori Wilhite, who has a very special announcement to That's make. That's right. For all the ladies in the room, for everybody watching at home or at one of our locations, I want to invite you personally to a very special event we have coming up in just over two weeks. It's October 19th and 20th here at the Henderson campus, and it's called the Leading and Loving It Retreat. We've been doing this for about 10 years, and it's a time where we're joined from women all around the country, all around the world. In fact, we just had a group register from South Africa, and so there'll be people that'll be with us from around the world. And the reason why we do this is because I want some things for you that I have been able to get for myself through retreat the last 10 years. So here's what I want for you. I want hope for your discouragement. I want healing for your brokenness. I want rejuvenation for your weariness. I want confidence for your insecurity. I want community for your loneliness. This has been a hard run, gals. And I want those things for you. And I'm going to be joined by some of my best friends. If you remember back to like last March or April when we did Refresh here, we were joined by Dr. Tara Jenkins. She was here with us on the weekend. She'll be back for this event. She's incredible. And just a few weeks ago, we had one of my best friends, Hosanna Wong, here. She'll be back as well. It's going to be incredible. So I hope you can join us in person. But if you can't, it's okay because you can join us online. And if you can't even stream live, it, you'll have it available to you on demand for an entire year, which means every day when you get ready for work, you can put your makeup on and get encouraged and uplifted. And you can hop online at central.family to register yourself and use the code word glory, which gets the cost down to what is literally my cost to put it on or because of a very generous donor here at the church. We have scholarships for people. So if you need a scholarship, all you need to do is come talk to me, shoot us an email. We want to help you be there. I would love to see every woman at our church at retreat be part of retreats to get filled up. So I'm going to be in the lobby right after the experience. I would love to talk to you and help you get signed up for retreat. Awesome. Let's give it up for Lori. Uh, one of the best things you can do for the ladies in your lives is give them that space and time where they can recharge and get rejuvenated. And so I hope you can all make it to the Leading and Loving It retreat. Well, I'm excited to be talk with you today about how we can continue to be happier together. I just thought I'd start with a question. How, how many of you feel like you need a vacation right now? Look, at, look around. Look at all those vacation people. Now, when it comes to vacations, have you noticed that like some people are like all adventurous on vacation and man, you want to see all the sights, you want to go to all the things, you want to explore everything, you want to go from dawn to dusk and fall into bed at the end of the day exhausted because that makes a good vacation. How many of you are adventurous vacationers? Awesome. The other kind of vacationer would be chill vacationers, right? You know, like you don't want to venture. You don't really care about seeing the sights. Um, you just want to be able to like sit down and read a book and drink some coffee and relax. Who are our chill vacationers, right? And so what happens when an adventurous vacationer meets a chill vacationer? They fall in love. They get married. And they start doing life together because opposites often attract. Now, this has been the tension Lori and I have faced for almost 25 years because she's an adventurous vacationer. She gets there, she wants to go. Every museum, every park, every site, every historical marker, she wants to see it all and be part of it. I get there and uh, I want to relax and chill because I'm already exhausted when I get on vacation. I don't want to come back more exhausted. You know, I want to like read a book, drink lots of coffee, brood. This is a great vacation, you know, for me. And so we try to navigate this. Now, those are the facts, okay? But the story we tell ourselves about the facts is very important. She could think to herself, man, this is our family vacation time. And Judd doesn't even prioritize me enough to want to spend all of his time running around from museum to museum with me. He doesn't even care. In fact, he wants to sit alone 
when this is our time together and he wants to brood about and drink his coffee and you know, try to make sense of the world, I'm not even sure he loves me. This is the choice that she could make in the story that she tells herself about the way I vacation. And I could say to myself, Lori doesn't respect what I do. She doesn't understand how exhausted I am when I get to vacation time. She doesn't realize how much I need to get recharged and how I can't get recharged if she, she just wants to run me ragged. I'm not even sure she cares. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because between the facts in our relationships, there is a story that we tell ourselves about our relationships. And the story we tell ourselves, Lori and I choose to tell ourselves a different story than the one I've just mentioned. We've learned that, hey, I love her. I love being around her. I love going on vacation with her. It's amazing. But she and I need different things out of a vacation. And so we now have an agreement. First of all, we try to vacation with other people. <laughs> Word. And then they can run around all day long and do all the things. And uh, those that want to chill can chill. But when it's just our family, her and my daughter, they run around, they explore the city, they go to all the museums, whatever. Ethan and I go back. We do one thing a day. That's my rule. One thing a day. It could be a four-hour thing. That's a lot, y'all. But one thing a day, I'm in. And then I need to chill and relax because at the end of that vacation, I got to come back and be ready to go and charged up and rested. And so we've learned, like, she needs something different than I need, and we can make a choice to either assume the worst about the other or believe the best. And I want to talk to you today about the power of believing the best. In the story that you tell yourself about the facts of your relationship with your kids, with your friends, with your coworkers, with the people around you, with your spouse, you can make a choice. You can assume the worst, but you can also choose to believe the best. Here's why it's so important. When you believe the best about others, you tend to bring out the best in others. When you believe the best about others, you tend to bring out the best in others. Somebody puts their hands together. That, that's the best I got this weekend. That's a nugget right there. That's what we call a nugget. That's a good one. You bring out the best in them in their life. Now, we've been talking about kind of this happier together strategy. We've looked at a few different things over the last several weeks. Uh, week one, we talked about the connection strategy, trying to focus in our relational world on uh, the things that draw us together rather than things that separate us. We talked about the new attitude strategy. Lori and I uh, shared a little bit about how if you change your attitude, you can change your life. And we talked about how you can only really change yourself, but if you choose a new attitude, it can make all the difference in your world. This week, we're going to talk about the believe the best strategy. Next week, we're going to kind of wrap this teaching series up. We're going to look at the healing strategy, dealing with the past so it doesn't blow up in the present. This is also our fall fest weekend. So we got pumpkins and family fun and all kinds of games for kids. And it's an awesome time. This is an awesome time to invite family, friends, uh, people that, you know, haven't been back to church in a while. I've been having a lot of fun inviting people to fall fest and to the weekend. In fact, I've been having about as much fun over the last season inviting people to church as I ever have. I think because with COVID and all of that for so long, it was weird and uh, it may still be weird, but I'm over it. So I'm just inviting people and I'm like, come on, man, let's go. But you know what I love is like walking into a place and people will see me that haven't been back to church in like a year and a half. And uh, one lady walked in, I walked in and, and, and she, she was sitting there and she's like, oh my gosh. I said, what? She goes, it's a sign. I haven't been back to church since COVID and God is telling me it's a sign. And you know what I say? I say, that's right. Absolutely. God is speaking to you right now. What are you going to do? Let me tell you all about what we got going on at church, you know, and so I break it all down for him. But this is a great season. Next weekend is a great time to invite friends, family, bring people along. We'll have a good, but here's what I'm finding. People are open to uh, invitations to church. They're open to a need in their life for community and for friendship and for God and um, to just be around something hopeful. Listen to this. I, I had a friend of mine say to me this, this week something I thought was very profound. He said, you know, when I was walking in the doors of Central last week, he said, I thought to myself, this is the only place I'm going to go this week where I'm confident what I'm going to hear is hopeful 
is honest and is true to God's word. And he said, there's so much misinformation. There, you can't believe anything you read anymore, right? There's so many posts and opinions and perspectives and everybody's got their bias. He said, you know, I just walked in and thought, this is a different thing for me in the rhythm of my week because here I believe I'm gonna hear what's honest and hopeful and true to God's word and I believe I can trust that and hang on to it in my life. But he goes, Jed, it's the only place I go in a given week where that is true. And so I think people have a need in their life for God, for his goodness, for community, for friends. So I invite them to come along with you next weekend. Um, and this idea of believing the best this weekend, this is a very countercultural idea. I mean, we live in a cancel culture. We tend to assume the worst. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, everybody tends to assume the worst about everybody else. And it feels like everybody's kind of mode of operation is to rip other people down. And I think, you know, the challenge with that is nobody's perfect. Eventually, cancel culture comes for everyone. Because we've all made mistakes and failed and got issues. And the Bible says there was only one perfect person. And that was Jesus. And you know what? They tried to cancel him. But he rose from the grave. Hello. Can you say uncanceled? But listen, this is why I think Jesus warned us against judging others. He said that the measure you use to judge others will be used against you. Man, that's, that's why the church is so important right now. The church is the last refuge of grace culture over cancel culture. It's the last refuge of forgiveness culture over outrage culture. Because we believe in second chances and we believe Jesus' grace is enough for all of us. And we can believe the best about ourselves and about each other because of what Jesus has done for us. If you wanna be happier together as a parent, as a friend, as a coworker, as a spouse, Choose to believe the best about the person you're in a relationship with. And I think it starts with ourselves. Believe the best about yourself. Believe the best about yourself. When my kids were little, um, I think my daughter was, Emma was eight years old. Um, one point, Lori was in the brainwashing process that you do with little kids. And she was explaining to her that we were the cool parents. Right? This is what you do while you can do it, okay? If you just have kids, take notes. She's in the brainwashing kind of phase there, trying, you know, you have the cool, and Emma goes, yeah, we're like a superhero family. Lori goes, yeah, we're like a superhero family. She goes, what are our superpowers? And Emma goes, well, I have the power of cuteness. She said, I'll stop the bad guys with my cuteness. And uh, she goes, my brother Ethan, he has the power of imagination. He'll stop the bad guys with his imagination. And my dad has the power of uh, the good words of the Bible. He'll use those words and he'll stop the bad guys with his words. And then she goes, mom, what do you, what, hmm, what's your superpower? She goes, mom, you have the superpower of bad cooking. <laughs> she says, you'll poison the bad guys with your cooking. <laughs> Which I'm telling you, she was snarky at eight years old, y'all. She knew that was funny. But you know, when you're a kid, you tend to believe that you can do anything, right? You tend to believe that the sky's the limit. You tend to believe positive things about your life and the future, but then life comes along and starts to beat you up, right? Then you go through difficulty or hardship or challenge or abuse. You get older, you go through failure, you make mistakes, you get things you wish you could take back. And it is easy as adults to believe the worst about ourselves. It's easy to think about our rap sheet, if you will, our failures, our mistakes, and believe the worst and hang on to the worst. But I want to encourage you today because as a child of God and as a person of faith, you have a choice and you can choose to believe who God says you are rather than who your past says you are. This will affect, this will affect how you relate to your spouse. This will affect how you treat your kids. This will, we rarely rise above our limiting beliefs. 
We rarely do. But by faith, through God's word, we can be empowered to live our lives differently. Check this out. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 22. When we get to the red word, say this out loud here with me. This is what the Bible says. It says, we are made what? Right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're all right. You're all right through what Jesus has done, look at this, and this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. You've been made right with God. Now it is possible to believe in Jesus and not believe in what he says about you. It's possible to believe in Jesus and not believe what he says about you. But Jesus says in him, you've been made right. You've been forgiven. You're free. You're empowered. You're not the sum total of your past or your failures or your mistakes. You can move forward now as a better version of yourself. You can choose to believe the best about yourself and others. In fact, um, Martin Seligman is a psychologist. I uh, wrote a book called Learned Optimism. And um, he gives some, I think, pretty interesting insights into how we handle ourselves, our view of ourselves and our view of others. And he talked about two explanatory styles um, when we go through something in our lives. One explanatory style is negative. The other would be positive. <laughs> On the negative, you know, he says if, if you have a negative explanatory style, then you go through something, you see it as permanent, you see it as pervasive, and you see it as personal. Here's an example. You apply for a job, but you don't get the job. And so immediately you walk away and you're like, they didn't hire me and they will never hire me. It's permanent. It's pervasive. Not only did they not hire me, no one will ever hire me. <laughs> Hello. And it's personal. They didn't hire me because I'm a loser. And we get in these negative explanatory cycles. You ask a girl out. She says no. And so you tell yourself, and by the way, no means no, hello. She says no, I'm not suggesting no doesn't mean no. No means no. But you could still say no means no, but no may not mean never, right? But it'd be easy to say, well, she said no. And then if they think it's pervasive, every girl will say no. No one will ever go out with me because I'm fill in the blank, a nerd, ugly, I look like Mr. Rogers, whatever. <laughs> it's a negative explanatory style, but, but doesn't it ring true? It does for me in my own life. Like I can go down this road with a whole lot of things and I can get myself trapped. This kind of way of explaining things, uh, Dr. Seligman calls learned hopelessness, but it's learned. It's actually a choice that we're making with the facts that have happened to us. The other option is we could take a positive explanatory style. And so you go through something and you realize, look, I applied for this job and they didn't hire me, but it's not unchangeable, it's actually changeable. Maybe someday in the future they will hire me. I don't know. And then it's specific, whatever you've gone through. They didn't hire me, but there are a lot of other people out there who are hiring. There are other options, right? And a more optimistic spin says it's situational. They didn't hire me, but, but maybe it wasn't simply about me. Maybe they were just looking for something else, or maybe they had uh, somebody in the queue that was more qualified or more experienced. And what I want you to understand is when we go through things in life, we actually make a choice that we learn and we can unlearn about how we're going to view those experiences in our own life. If you continue to choose a negative explanatory style over your life, if you think everything that happens, it's permanent, it's pervasive, it's personal, you're gonna be negative, you're gonna be critical, you're gonna hate yourself and others, you're gonna be angry and you're gonna be less happy. A lot of, there's a lot of anger right now in our world, amen? That just means it is true, by the way, in case of you're like, what, I don't know. It's true, a lot of anger. Um, and that anger is often directed out at other people. But I wanna suggest a lot of the anger we're seeing is actually a result of issues people have with themselves. They just don't realize it yet. And they have an explanatory style that has trapped themselves in a lot of negative, uh, bad mojo 
kind of places. And so that anger starts exploding out in all kinds of different ways. You think about the gospel. Our sin problem is permanent, it's pervasive, and it's personal. But Jesus came and died on the cross and rose again so that we can move forward realizing, yes, I'm a sinner, but I'm saved by grace. My situation isn't condemnation. It is now salvation because of what God has done. Yeah. My sin is pervasive, you know, like it's, it's in my life, it's there, but God's spirit is also pervasive in my life. And so I might have failed in this area of my life or even failed this morning, but that doesn't mean I'll always fail in that area of my life and it will always move forward with that specific failure. God's spirit can really change and help me grow. And so I've got a situation that I'm navigating, but there's hope in that situation. In fact, in a few weeks, I'm gonna kick off a brand new teaching series. I've just decided to call it Hopeful why the best is still to come. And I'm gonna talk about how God is still good and he's still moving, he's still working, he's still victorious. That's why we can hang on to hope, but we need hope in our lives. And some of it just comes back to how we choose to interpret things that we're experiencing day in and day out in our lives. And so Romans chapter nine, beginning in verse 25, gives us this, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. It reminds us to focus on all the good that God says about us as people. He's speaking of his people. He says, I'll call them nobodies and make them what? Somebodies, right? I'll call them, I'll call the unloved and make them beloved. In the place where they they yelled out, you're nobody, they're calling you God's living children. So listen, you may have felt like a nobody. I want you to think about this. You're not a nobody because you're in a relationship that is struggling right now. You're not a nobody because you're single. You're not a nobody because you're divorced. You're, You're not a nobody because your spouse cheated. You're not a nobody because you don't have kids. You're you're not a nobody because you have kids and they're driving you insane. Listen, you're you're not a nobody because you have learning challenges or because somebody uh, hurts you or, or because you never got a degree in your life. You're not a nobody because you lost a job or because, you know, that important person in your life made you feel like trash. You're not a nobody because God has made you a somebody. You are a somebody because he sees you. He sees you. You're a somebody because God loves you. You're a somebody because God declares you forgiven and free and worthy of his love in Jesus Christ. You're a somebody that God wants to bless. You're somebody he wants to work with. You're somebody he wants to honor. You're somebody who he wants to share in his victory. And so you don't have to wait to be a somebody. You don't have to wait. You don't have to get married to be a somebody. You don't have to have a child for us to be a somebody. You don't have to wait to change someone else's mind for you to be a somebody. God has called you to be a somebody in him. In fact, turn to the person next to you and say, you're somebody. You are somebody in Christ. And my challenge, if there's a lot of anger in your home right now, if there's a lot of frustration coming out, is before you simply put it all on the people around you that you stop and you look inside. The issue may be how you view yourself and the fact that you have such a negative, self-destructive view of yourself that it starts coming out on everybody else. But you start speaking God's word to yourself and reminding yourself, who are you gonna believe? You're gonna believe yourself? Whatever your mind says, are you going to believe God and what he says in his word and let that change how you see yourself and let that start changing how you explain things to yourself? I'm not just talking about the power of like positive thinking or like when I look at Seligman's um, explanatory styles, if you're a follower of Jesus with all the good news of the gospel over your life, you have every right to explain things to yourself in in a way filled with faith, hope, and love. You can choose to believe the best because of what God has done and who he is. All right. Another thought is this, to believe the best about others. Believe the best about others. I don't know if you've ever seen a car like this, but sometimes people will pull up and they'll be like, hey, jump in my car, and, and their car looks something like that. That's, that's usually what a, a parent with young kids' car kind of looks like. 
Lori and I have very different perspectives on cars, by the way. Uh, I like a clean car. How many of you like a clean car? I mean, clean car people. Look at all those people. Lori, where are you? Ah, <laughs> next service. I'll get her in here. Um, man, I remember when our kids were young, that'd be French fries all over everywhere and just constant McDonald's bags and just like a nuclear explosion of junk all the time. And, and I would, I would often get so frustrated. I would go out to clean the car and I would talk under my breath and I was not believing the best. I remember I'm like cleaning the car out, you know, and I'm like, man, she doesn't, she doesn't respect this car. She doesn't realize how much this Honda minivan cost. Hello. This, we had the one, we were so excited back in the day, this is going to tell you how old I am, when they had the electric doors and you could pull it and they would like go open and we just stood there, we're like, you don't even have to touch it. Our kids can just walk up and just pull the thing and it just does it. Anyway, it's come a long way since then. But I'm out there, I'm cleaning it, and I'm like, if she knew, you know, she doesn't respect the car, she doesn't care how much it costs, she doesn't care, look, I'm out now, I have to come out here because this stuff stresses me out, and I have to clean it, I got other things I need to do, I'm out here cleaning the car for her, hello, and then she'll just trash it all over again. But then I saw some research years ago by Dr. Sandra Murray of the State University of New York, and they did research on couples that stayed together over a long time. And they tried to find like, what is it that causes these couples to stay together and to be relatively happy enough to stay together? You know, like what, what, what was the unifying thing? And they couldn't find anything for a long time. There was like, there was nothing universal that they found that applied to all of these couples. But then they found one thing that actually did apply to every single couple. And they said it was this, the husband in all of those relationships rated his wife better than she rated herself. And some lady's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More of that. Where do I find that guy, right? In other words, the husbands chose to see their wives better than their wives saw themselves. Marcus Buckingham writes about this study, the leadership writer. And he says, if we could boil down this whole study into one principle, it would, it would be this. Find the most generous explanation of each other's behavior and believe it. Find the most generous explanation of each other's behavior and believe it. That's believing the best about each other. It's actually a choice that we make. And I remember I'd be out there cleaning the car, mumbling under my breath. And that just kind of made me stop and realize, yeah, Lori doesn't really care about a clean car. But you know what she cares about that's even more important than a clean car? She cares about people. She's, that's why I was attracted to her from the very beginning. She loves people. People are always first to her. She doesn't care about things. She doesn't really care about money. She doesn't care about stuff. She cares about people. That's what drives her. And while our car may not have always been clean, our kids always knew how much they were loved. But you see, I had to make a choice when I'm out there cleaning the car. How am I going to interpret this car? And if I choose the most generous explanation, it puts it in a whole different light, right? And then I had to actually step back and realize, as much as I hated to admit it, I like cleaning the car. This actually brings me joy. People last night were like, hey man, where you live? We'll drop our car off, you can fire it up. I like cleaning the car because when I'm done washing the car, if I detail our car, and I got all the things, y'all, all the detailed things, when I'm done, I'm actually done, at least for an hour. Because nothing in my life is finished, you know, work-wise, ministry-wise, people, working with people, you never like clock out like we're done. But I love that I can like wash the car, get it all detailed and be like, I'm done. It's awesome. Feels so good until she drives it the next day and we start the process all over again. <laughs> but I had to choose to recast that whole thing in my life. Here, here's what Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse nine says. It says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them, hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in what? 
honoring each other and honoring each other. Listen, behind many frustrations is the possibility of a generous explanation. You say, she's not controlling, she's detail-oriented. <laughs> and you remember how much you loved her ability to be organized, right? Go back to that. He's not neglectful for how much time he spends at work or on projects. He's driven, he's just trying to provide. Uh, your parent isn't just demanding, but they see your potential and they don't want you to miss out on any opportunities in your life. That, that customer, they're not just mean, they're also tired and they feel like no one hears them or helps them. That person blowing past you in traffic. Come on, somebody. Maybe they just found out someone they love is in trouble. That dad of the girl you started dating, maybe he's not just a suspicious and scary psycho. He is that. <laughs> but maybe he's more than that because maybe he's just trying to protect his little girl. That person who's posting an opinion online that you disagree with, hello. Maybe they're not evil. Maybe they're not intent on destroying everything. Maybe they just have a different lived experience and a different expression of that experience. And you can disagree with them without demonizing them. You can believe the best and offer a generous explanation. Some, somebody right now is thinking, yeah, but that's, that's naive. Like people don't deserve a generous explanation. Here's what I want to suggest. Even if you find out you're wrong, you will still be happier if you choose until you find out you're wrong to assume the most generous explanation, you will have lower blood pressure. You will have more sense of peace and joy flowing through your life. I'm seeing a lot of nods because I think deep down, especially with our loved ones, we all know, yeah, that's, that's kind of true. And so we can choose to have a generous explanation. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 18. Look at this. Do all that you can to live in peace with who? Everyone. everyone. And everyone means everyone. Everyone. Even those people. Those people. Everyone. What if we all went through the next hour or day or week or month and we just refused to be offended? Think about it. Your kids ask you to drop them off a mile away from school. Just refuse to be offended. It's a shock, parents, the first time it happened. I remember I was like, what? We've been brainwashing you that we're the cool parents all these years and it's over? Look, you, you see some friends post pictures on Instagram at a gathering that you were not invited to. Refuse to be offended. Uh, you, your parents compliment a sibling and not you. Refuse to be offended. Your spouse does not notice your haircut. Hello. <laughs> Refuse to be offended. They love you. They're just oblivious. You have to explain to them things that they should have seen. And I'm not saying we, we suggest that, that bad stuff doesn't happen. Listen, believe the best, but you can still address the worst. You don't have to turn a blind eye to abuse or lying or uh, unfaithfulness or, you know, all the bad stuff that goes on. Listen, and neither does the gospel. When you look at the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not about blind optimism. Jesus died for our sins because we're sinners and we're a mess. You can believe the best and still address the worst when you need to address it. But we'll all be better served if we choose that perspective. I saw this guy on Twitter and um, he put it together so well just in this perspective on his fiance. He says, my fiance can't sing, not a single note hit, couldn't carry a tune if it had handles. <laughs> he says, I have never told her this and I never will because singing makes her happy and seeing her happy makes the dark days a little brighter. Sea shanty, see shanties, anime intros, anything she wants to sing, I happily listen. Sometimes she even sings me to sleep. It makes me feel incredibly loved. I can be silently irate and hear her singing in another room and it will make me smile and chuckle to myself. I know everything will be okay. 
I absolutely dread the day that my world falls silent, or even worse, into key. Now that's somebody believe in the best. And if you'll believe the best about yourself, and you believe the best about others, you'll bring out the best in others. You'll be happier, but ultimately, people will tend to rise to your belief about them, your loved ones, those who are close to you. And just by you believing the best about them could lift their behavior. And so friends, all of us this week, let's refuse to be offended. Let's choose the most generous explanation we can choose for as long as we can hold on to it. And let's give people the benefit of the doubt and especially our family, our loved ones, followers of Jesus. Let's remember we're about grace culture over cancel culture and we're about forgiveness culture over outrage culture. We're about being people who have received a second chance because of what Jesus Christ did for us and therefore we can extend a second chance to others whether they deserve it or not because we didn't deserve it but God was good and kind to us anyway. You'll have more joy You'll be happier together, and you may be a huge light in someone else's darkness just by making that commitment. Maybe you're here today, and maybe you've never crossed the line of faith. i just love to give you an opportunity to reach out to God and ask him to move and work in your heart and in your life. So would all of you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you'd like to become a follower of Jesus, you can take that step today by repeating a simple prayer after me, either out loud or in your own heart and mind. I believe God knows and hears to say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges that I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name. Friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, if it's your commitment, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air. Just make eye contact with me just to say before God and to say to me, you're going to trust him in your life today. Just slip your hand in the air. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Just reach out to him today. Thank you guys. God, I just I thank you for each person reaching out to you right now and pray you'll fill them with your goodness, your grace, your forgiveness, your joy, your spirit. God, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship you. And I pray you'll just send us out with a sense of hope and a sense of peace anchored in who you are. We thank you for this moment in Christ's name. Amen.